What's up, YouTube? Welcome back to the Regular Pioneer channel. I'm your host, Matt, and thank you for joining me for another episode. As you can see, I got my little sticker today. I voted. Very excited. Voted for the first time in my life. Feels very freeing. And uh, I'm in a little bit of a different setting. I'm going to go back to my regular setting for the next video. But just wanted to drop a quick video tonight and talk about my first judicial meeting as an elder. Judicial committees are something that many Jehovah's Witnesses don't know a lot about in terms of the inner workings. Now, many Jehovah's Witnesses have had a judicial committee because they have been deemed to commit a serious sin and therefore they have to sit before the elders and be judged. But very few Jehovah's Witnesses have been on the other side of the table when it comes to a judicial committee. And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to give some insight to the elders perspective of a judicial committee. And really my point is to show that there is no Holy Spirit in the process. It's really just policy driven by the Watchtower organization. It's not based on anything divine. The elders not getting any divine spirit. They're really just following policy from a book. Now, I would strongly suggest Everyone, whether you are, are a non-witness, whether you are a current Jehovah's Witness, whether you are an ex-witness, please look up on the internet, Shepherd the Flock of God. That is the name of the secret elders handbook that only elders are supposed to have access to. I would strongly suggest you get a PDF of that book. Now, it's a secret. You're not supposed to know about it. But the reason why I say you should look it up is because if there are rules for an organization, you should be able to know them. And there are so many ways in the elders handbook that you could be brought up on a judicial committee. I mean, I'm not kidding. There are so many listed paragraphs on reasons to create a judicial committee. Now, for all my non-witnesses, and people who have never been witnesses watching, I want to try to explain the vocabulary a little bit. You might be asking yourself, what is a judicial committee? Well, a judicial committee is when a witness sits in front of three elders who judge whether a witness is repentant enough from the sin that they committed to continue being one of Jehovah's Witnesses or not. So let me give you a little primer on how this all works. So generally, when someone commits what is considered a serious sin, their conscience bothers them and they go confess to the elders that they have committed a sin. Then two elders sit down and they take this confession. Then they bring it back to the rest of the elder body. The elder body then uh, forms a judicial committee. Then that judicial committee will go judge that person's repentance. Now, there are other circumstances where someone gets, you know, snitched out or something and the elders have evidence brought to them. And then two elders are selected to do an investigation. And then if it is found to uh, have been a serious sin, then, of course, again, you create a judicial committee. Now, who is made up of the judicial committee? There are three elders. There is one elder that is selected to be the chairman. The chairman is supposed to make contact with the accused and make a date that they can all meet together for this meeting. Then the chairman also is expected to uh, chair the meeting, uh, make sure it flows properly, not take control of it or dominate it. Make sure the other two elders have a say, but control the flow of the meeting. And then later on, if there is a decision to disfellowship, the chairman usually does the write up and sends the S77 form to the branch. Now, how does a judicial meeting normally go? Well, normally you invite in the accused. There's a, a word of prayer. The accused says their side of the story and they they give all their confession and their needed information. Then the elders from there ask numerous questions. I mean, it's normally a barrage of questions, question after question. Then 
after the elders have asked all their questions, shared scriptures, tried to show the accused why what they did was wrong from a scriptural standpoint, then the accused is asked to leave the room. The elders sit together. They say a prayer because, of course, Jehovah's Holy Spirit is on this. Not really, but that's what they think. And then they discuss the decision. They ask the accused to come back in. If the accused is disfellowship, they let them know that. They let them know that they have seven days to appeal. And if they choose not to appeal, after seven days, they will be announced as no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. If they are not disfellowship, there's something called reproof. Reproof means that you committed a serious sin, but you are deemed as repentant. So there are two types of reproof. There is public reproof where you will lose certain privileges in the congregation and this reproof will be announced to the entire congregation at the midweek meeting. And then there is private reproof. Private reproof is the same thing. You are getting uh, certain responsibilities and privileges taken away, but it is not announced to everyone at the meeting. And that is deemed to be based on who knows about the sin that was committed. So that's just a general primer on what judicial meetings are and how they work. Now that you understand that, let me explain to you how my first judicial meeting went. So let's start from the very beginning. Monday night, I'm driving, I stop at a stoplight. I, get, I see a text on my phone from a brother in my field service group. So he sent a group text to me and my cousin. Now my cousin was the group service, uh, the group field service group overseer. I was his assistant. Uh, we were serving on the same body of elders and uh, the brother in our group sends us both a text saying, listen, my daughter needs to talk to both of you brothers on Wednesday at the meeting. So me and my cousin talk and we're like, Ugh, this doesn't sound good. You know, it's probably something of a judicial matter. And of course it was. So Wednesday we get to the meeting and, you know, meeting starts. We invite her in the back room and if... If you are a Jehovah's Witness or you've been a Jehovah's Witness, you know about that back room. The council goes down. Bad. If you're in the back room, it's bad, you know? So she comes back there and she confesses, um, you know, I uh, committed fornication, blah, 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 X, Y, Z. So we're taking down this confession. Now, you got to look at it from her perspective, right? You got two young elders. I was 25 at the time. My cousin was 27. She's a 19, 20 year old young lady. And she's explaining these, you know, these things she did. I didn't really want to hear all of it. You know, I just wanted to know that she confessed to committing a sin, but she's, you know, pouring out her heart. So my cousin, he's, you know, typing away on his iPad, writing notes. I'm, I'm a pen and paper kind of guy. So I'm writing down my notes. You know, it's probably really embarrassing, really, uh, really tough for her to do this. But she's, she's giving us this whole confession so we get the confession we go to the coordinator and we tell them listen you know we got a confession from sister so-and-so we're gonna have to form a judicial committee so after the meeting we have an elders meeting we form that judicial committee so because my cousin and i took the confession we were selected to be on the committee but then they wanted an older more experienced brother to serve with us so they picked a brother in his mid-70s old school cat bald and big old hairy mustache, you know, and he was going to be the chairman to kind of guide us young bucks on the way. So we make a date that Saturday after our meeting, because we had our uh, public meeting on Saturdays in that congregation, one o'clock on Saturday afternoons. It was absolutely terrible. Couldn't stand it. Um, so we make a date, you know, that Saturday after the meeting, we're going to do this judicial. So we rush into the room right after the meeting. And I gave the public talk that meeting. So, you know, everybody's, hey, great talk, brother. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. I got to go to the back. <laughs> so get to the back. You know, we have a little three elder powwow real quick. Just make sure we're all on the same page. Then we invite the sister in. Say a prayer. All right, boom, let's get started. Now, this is my first judicial meeting. I'm nervous. You know, my cousin had done numerous. This other brother, this uh, old school cat, had done billions of judicials so I'm you know I'm trying to sit back a little bit I want to participate but I want to see how they handle things I want to you know get into the flow so after we open with prayer and we allow her to tell us what happened 
the questions come. Now, if you've ever had a judicial committee before, especially if it was something of a sexual nature, the questions are the worst part. Now, I had never had a judicial. I, you know, I, as a Jehovah's Witness, I had never been in any kind of trouble in that sense. So I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> this older brother comes with these super invasive questions and I was not prepared for that. You know, to me it was enough, all right. We know she committed fornication with her worldly boyfriend. So to me that was all we really need to know. Nah, this brother was asking everything. Like when I when I say everything, I, I and I wrote down some of the things that that he uh was asking. For example, this is some of the things he asked. What kind of sex did you have? Were you having oral sex? Were you having anal sex? Whoa, 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 playboy. I, now, of course, you know, I'm playing it cool. Got my poker face on. But in my head, I'm like, whoa, whoa. Why are we asking all of this? You know, he continues, you know, how often did you have sex with your boyfriend? Where did you have sex with your boyfriend? Did you use uh, protection when you had sex with your boyfriend? Did you have an orgasm? Whoa! Whoa! Why are we asking all of this? And again, this is a 19, 20 year old girl, well, woman, and a 70 something year old old dude is asking her these questions. Now, at this point, I don't know what my face said, but I know in my head, I'm like, bruh, we, we don't really need to know all that. I mean, I don't think that's that important to understand in repentance. Because really, the whole point is to judge whether someone is repentant or not. I don't need to know what kind of sex you was having. I really don't. You told me you was having sex. That's wrong according to the Bible. All right. You know, he's asking all these questions and it didn't stop there. I, I remember this so clearly. He asked her, are you pregnant? And she kind of was like taken back. She's like, no, no, I'm not pregnant. And he's like, oh, well, how do you know? Did you have your uh, menstrual period? Bruh, how is that any of your business? Now, I'm sure she was thinking that. I was thinking that. I don't know what my cousin was thinking. I'm sure he might he might have been thinking that too. But, you know, she's just like, listen, like, no, I'm not pregnant. All right. And I'm just like, whoa, like, is this normal? Are we supposed to be asking all these questions? Because this is a bit ridiculous. So anyway, we go through about two hours of confessing and questioning, confessing and questioning. I mean, we got into all kinds of things, things she did before she got baptized. And I'm like, how is that even relevant? But OK, so finally, we get to the last question. Now, this sister had been dating a worldly guy. So the chairman, old brother elderly brother decides to ask well are you willing to break up with your boyfriend and a sister just looks at us puts her head down and in my head i'm like sis just say yes please just say yes because i know what's gonna happen you know if she says anything but yes that's it she gotta get this fellowship and the room was just silent. And like, we're all waiting for her to just say, yes, I will break up with him. Like, like we're like, please, sis, just say it. You know, in our heads, like, we all like, please, just say it. She ain't say it. So we had to dismiss her from the room. Uh, we said a little prayer. I, I believe I was the one that said the prayer. And then um, we're like, well, brothers, what decision are we coming to? We're all like, yeah, this fellowship. And it's funny. <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, but you know, you always hear that Jehovah guides you to these decisions. So I don't know if I was expecting, you know, Holy Spirit to fly in my head or something or, you know, some kind of special voice. Or, I don't know. But it wasn't any Holy Spirit that guided me to that decision. It was just very simple. The sister wasn't willing to break up with her boyfriend. She admitted that she committed fornication. It's really just making a judgment call. And 
The reason why I know there is no Holy Spirit guiding this decision is because I've been on numerous judicial committees as an elder. I've heard of numerous judicial committees. I had so many elders as friends who served on judicial committees. And at times, the wrong, de the wrong decision was made. I know personally, firsthand, of some really bad stories of the wrong decision being made because there was wrong evidence, because elders were too quick to make decisions. And if Jehovah's Holy Spirit was really guiding these decisions, then the right decision would be made every single time. Because remember, Jehovah is not supposed to put you to the test. That's what the Bible says. So if Jehovah is not supposed to put you to the test, how could you be disfellowshipped wrongfully? Think about that. So we bring the sister back in. We tell her, listen, you know, you're disfellowshipped. Uh, we kind of explain to her what was expected of her. We explained to her the appeals process. We explained to her, you know, how to get reinstated. And so we ended. Uh, I remember my cousin and the other brother gave her a ride home. I had my own car. So I'm like, whew, I'm sure that was awkward. I'm glad I could drive home by myself. So I was hungry because I hadn't eaten the whole day. Like I said, I gave the public talk early in the morning. You know, I was nervous about that. I'm nervous about the judicial, so I hadn't eaten. I'm starving. Now, go through the drive-thru, pick up some Popeyes. And if anybody knows me, they know I love Popeyes. Popeyes fried chicken. Woo, love it. But then I get home, and I'm home alone. My wife went out with some of her friends, and I'm just sitting down on the couch alone. And it really hit me then. I'm like, man, we just disfellowshipped this sister. She's going to be disconnected from her family. I had all that power in my hands. And I'm just an imperfect person. Nothing special was bestowed upon me. You know, I just came to what I thought was the rational decision with two other men. Why do I have this much power? And it, it was a really scary thought. You know, and, and to this day, I still feel guilty about it because last I heard, she hasn't been reinstated and I have no idea what her relationship now is with her family. And I just feel terrible that I was a part of this decision where I had so much power. And I mean, listen, by JW rule, I did everything right. You know, she should have been disfellowship according to the rules. But there's so much issue with the rules themselves. You know, it's so pharisaical. There's so much policy and not a lot of principle. I mean, there's nowhere in the Bible where it says I need to act as a judge on a judicial committee. Now, I know, you know, if we look in the Hebrew scriptures, there were judges for certain times. But as a Christian and as Jehovah's Witnesses, we were believing that we were not under law. We were not under the Mosaic law. So we're in a Christian Greek scriptures, does it say that I need to serve as a judge? Yeah, some people would dismiss from the congregation in the first century as you read the scriptures, but it didn't say, you know, we need to sit down and have some pharisaical judicial committee based on policy coming from the Watchtower organization. And when you look in the scriptures, Jesus many times put the spirit of the law over the letter of the law. Now, obviously, in this case, that didn't matter, right? What this sister did was wrong according to the scriptures and according to, you know, the Bible principles. So she had to be disfellowshipped. But it's not my place to push someone out the congregation and tell their family not to talk to them, not to greet them. That's that's cruel. And that's something that Jesus wouldn't have standed for. Jesus, the way he was described in the scriptures, did not stand for cruel nonsense like that. And, you know, it's, like I said, to this day, I still feel guilty about being a part of that judicial committee and forcing that family to break apart, in a sense. And by the way, you know, sis, if if by some means you happen to see this video, please reach out to me so we can talk. I, I'd really, truly would love to apologize to you for that because, you know, I'm sorry. Even though I'm not a Christian anymore, even following Christian beliefs, I'm not, I, don't, I just don't think it's right to be so harsh on someone who participated in a natural act. 
you know, with someone that they cared about. I, I just find it, you know, so pharisaical the way Jehovah's Witnesses participate in these uh, judicial committees and, and subject these friends who feel like, you know, their conscience is bothered and they want to do the right thing before God, you know, to this abuse. I, I, I just ugh, feel so terrible that I was ever part of that. But anyway, I just wanted to share that story, give you a little insight. I know the elder stories are very popular because people want to know what elders think and what elders do behind closed doors. So that's just a little explanation of one of my judicial committees. I'll be back in the future with more stories on my judicial committees. And I definitely want to, you know, open the veil, you know, op open the curtain so that people can see what goes on. Uh, when it comes to Jehovah's Witness policy and what elders do, please go online. As I mentioned before, look up the Shepherd, the Flock of God Secret Elders Handbook for Jehovah's Witnesses. You will be surprised some of the things you read in that book. Well, that's it for today. Thank you, everyone, for watching the Irregular Pioneer channel again. I'm sorry if you heard my daughter's iPad in the back. I had a little change of scenery, but... As anyone with kids know, the kids really run the house sometimes. <laughs> All right. Much love, everyone. Take care. Be well. See you next time.